Okay. Welcome everyone to our session on preparing for the European job market for economists for this year. Um, I'm going to kick off by just introducing uh, our contributors, a uh, quick overview of what uh, we'll cover and uh, a couple of sort of housekeeping uh, announcements. Uh, the first one of which we'll start with, which is that this session is being recorded and the recording will be made available publicly uh, after uh, the event in a day or two's time. Uh, our contributors uh, this afternoon uh, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. So starting with Alessandra. Hello, everybody. My name is Alessandra Guadilla, and I'm a professor of financial economics at the University of Birmingham. And I'm going to talk about how to do a good job market paper presentation today. Uh, ben? I'm Ben Eckridge. I'm a senior lecturer uh, in the uh, Department of Economics at, at Essex. And I'm going to be talking about um, hiring from the point of view of the institution. Uta. Hi, I'm Uta Bold. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Bristol, and I will be talking about how to choose between different offers. Sankan. Hi, everyone. My name is Hungan Martinez. I'm an assistant professor of economics at the University of Nottingham, and I'll be talking about the experience of the candidate as someone who went through the market uh, not too long ago. Okay, so the batting order will be, we will start with uh, arrangements for the job market from the candidate's perspective, some Kun, and from the institution's perspective, that will be Ben. Uh, then we'll go on to the putting together uh, the presentations, and that will be Alessandra. And then uh, we'll conclude the, the presentations with uh, Uta talking about um, choosing between job offers. Uh, I'd like you to use the chat function for um, any questions and comments, and our presenters will probably be able to um, respond to some extent, at least as we go along. If we've got outstanding questions at the end, we can quickly uh, gather them together. Uh, this is a Royal Economic Society uh, sponsored event. Uh, so uh, it's quite important, I think, that we just take a moment uh, to look at the RES Code of Conduct, uh, which has just been put up on the screen. So we can leave it there just for a very short while. Okay, right. So uh, I think we can now uh, move into the proceedings proper and I'll ask Sun Kun to kick off, please. Sure. Let me just share my slides. I only... Okay, so I only have a couple of slides, um, but from the perspective of the candidate, I want to start talking about what you actually control, right? Because as you go into this process, um, it might seem like a bit of a black box as to all of the machinations that go into you finding a job, matching with an institution and handling offers. As you go into it, there's a lot of stress and a lot of considerations, but in terms of what you actually control in improving your chances and giving yourself the best outlook right now is a relatively short list of things, right? It's already November. You're not going to add a bunch of publications to your CV in the next three weeks. Right. So what you do control is the quality of the presentation of your paper as you submit it to your applications. This is kind of the most obvious thing, but you might be wanting to know what you can still do at this point in, and what is important. So there, having been on both sides of the market, in your paper, getting to that first round, getting to that first interview and being offered those first interviews as part of the European job market, you're likely to be shortlisted off of your abstracts and introductions. The other parts of your applications, right, so your recommendation letters and so forth, are not fully in your control, but it is still worth mentioning now that if your abstracts and, and introductions aren't completely solid, they should be by the time people are reading them, right? That's kind of the first thing that you might still be control, concerned about and want to make sure is rock solid. All right. 
The second, of course, is kind of logistical and still fairly obvious, is where and how you apply. So getting your applications in on time and making sure everything goes in as they should is a pretty basic thing to do. But when you're applying to, I think typically these days, what, 150, 200 postings, this can be kind of a heavy lift. So I would recommend my personal strategy was to make a spreadsheet with all of the institutions, each institution's requirements. So maybe a column of institutions, column of how many letters of recommendations they require, teaching statements, research statements, cover letters. Each institution might have idiosyncrasies and what you need. And so having a spreadsheet to keep track of those things will be helpful. You can also, in this spreadsheet, I would say keep track of what you've put in as you go forward and keep track of where your advisors are sending their letters, right? You want to make sure that these institutions are also getting your letters. Your advisors may be writing for multiple people, and it's your responsibility more than theirs to make sure that for you, their letters are going in on time at the institutions they need to go to, right? That's just logistical. Right, and then the last thing that I, I, that's in your control at this point in time are your presentation skills. Now, Alessandra is going to go over kind of techniques and general methods more in depth. The thing that I would say now, though, from the perspective of someone who recently went through it, is that no amount of practice is wasted, right? The first interview you do, especially in the first stage, I remember being incredibly nervous, right? You sit down. Uh, I, my, at my point, it was still in person, but my first interview, I sat down in front of nine people, right? There was a panel of nine interviewers and there, it was a long table and they were all looking at me. And in that situation, you're kind of sweating buckets. How you get over that is to have practiced so thoroughly that even when you no longer control your own body, your mouth just takes over and you <laughs> do your presentation and you deliver it perfectly because you've practiced it so much, right? That's your only insurance. Um, in that regard, for the first round, I think there's a general approach that we usually coach our PhD, PhD students to take. You want nested versions of your presentation of varying lengths, right? So you wanna sit down and your first two minutes should summarize your paper in two minutes, right? Your motivation, your question, and your method. The next three minutes will build into a larger five minute presentation, right? Oral presentation that gives a larger overview of the important details of your paper. And lastly, you should be able to continue talking through your paper for an additional five to 10 minutes after that. So what that means is that in your head, you have essentially approximately a two minute version of your presentation, a five to seven minute version of your presentation and a 10 to 15 minute version, I would recommend nesting these like a Russian doll such that your two minutes leads directly into your five to seven, which leads directly into your 10 to 15. This means that you won't have to have different versions of your presentation prepared. They'll naturally extend into one another. And again, practice, 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 because especially your first couple, it's going like, it, there's no getting around it. They're, they're kind of scary. And the only way to ensure that your nerves don't, you know, take over is that you're so practiced that it doesn't matter. Right. So that's kind of the general overview in my point of view of what you still control and what you can still do to kind of improve outcomes um, as much as possible at this stage when we're, when we're just on the precipice of the actual market about to begin. Okay. Now, from there, I'll talk a little bit about the experience itself. Okay. So, we all know the market is stressful, right? There's a lot that you can't control, right? And there's a lot of waiting that you do. This waiting especially is quite stressful. When you're waiting for your first round interviews, you're waiting for those emails and calls to schedule them. A couple things that I would, that I took away from the market that I would hope might help some of you in managing the stress. The first is to recognize that the job market it's not a ranking process. It's more of a matching process, right? Yes, there are some institutions who have the luxury of full flexibility in who they hire year to year. These institutions are rare, but, you know, which means that it's mostly not the case that high, people who are hiring are going on the market and saying, we're just going to look for the best possible researcher every year. That's not really how it works. There are some maybe elite institutions where that is their hiring philosophy and they have the resources 
and the year-to-year -year flexibility to do that. But that's going to be the minority. In my experience, having been on both sides of the market, there's much more behind the listings as the idiosyncrasies between departments on what they're looking for, right? There may be specific teaching needs, there may be specific field needs, and there may be other institutional constraints that make it as much a matching process as it is an evaluation of the quality of research that you do. Now I say this to kind of help you understand that I, that it isn't, you know, it's not only not beneficial from a mental health perspective to think about your, your, uh, the interviews you're offered, the placements that you're offered as, you know, somehow an evaluation of you, right? But also, but it's really more a, a question of fit as much as it is a question of quality. And it's, I think it's important to keep that in mind as you go through this, because there will be some frustrations and things. Um, the second is that I really think it's helpful to look at the market as much of an opportunity as something that you like as, that, as a stress mechanism in the sense that you will never again have the opportunity to talk to so many people who are so interested in what you're doing on any particular project, right? The amount of feedback and quality feedback you get from the variety of people on the market is kind of incredible. It gives you like a really rich perspective, I think, on a variety of different people from different departments views on what they're looking for in research. And I personally, ex post found this very instructive. During it, it's, see it, it can kind of fight like you're fighting for your professional life but i think one thing that i took away from it after the fact was just the amount of quality feedback that i got on the work and how i was going about it was incredibly instructive and actually helpful to my work going forward so do understand right that this feedback is useful and try to look at it as much of a learning experience during the actual process of it, of it as much as you try to see it as an interview experience, right? Um, and the last thing I would say, right, is as you're going through this, is to remember that as people who are graduating with PhDs in economics, you're exceptionally employable, right? Your outside options outside of the academic market, right? If you're here, right, listening to this presentation, obviously you're going into the academic market, hoping to stay in academia. But your outside options here is not unemployment, right? Remember that you're exceptionally employable, meaning that your outside options are probably a career with reduced flexibility and an increase in income relative to being an academic. This is not, this is pretty unique to economics because of the skill sets you're graduating with. And so while you're in the middle of it, that may not be too reassuring, but I think it is worth remembering, right? That you are going into not, you know, in your future career, it isn't just about this market. There's a longer term sorting process. And even if you don't find the opportunities that you're hoping for this year, your overall employment opportunities over the career path because of the work you've done up to this point are still quite exceptional. Um, and it's worth keeping that in mind in terms of managing stress, I would say. Right. So that's my spiel. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that uh, I haven't, I can't see the chat and whatnot, but uh, uh, there's... Yeah. There's nothing in the chat at the moment, I think. Thank you very much, okay. uh, Sung Kun. And yeah. we'll move on to Ben um, from the other side of the market. Hi, all. Hi. Good to be here. Um, and I agree with everything that was just said. And um, I'm going to say something that hopefully, ah, if I can get it working. Apologies. If I can. I'm going to say some things, there we go. Um, I'm going to say some things which hopefully complement what Sun Kung uh, was just saying. And I'm going to try and... Uh, I can't get full screen, apologies. Okay, so the hiring process from the perspective of the institution, I'm also going to kind of focus on the interview stage, I was meant to do kind of two minutes on interviews. So it's the general process, but a bit of a focus on the kind of interview interview stage. Okay, and I should say, kind of complementing what we said before, this process is very heterogeneous on the institution side. So I can describe um, my personal experience, which is all at University of Essex. I guess we do things differently to say Harvard, 
but even we do probably do it differently to you know departments which are of a kind of similar ranking and um, you know we have different preferences and that kind of thing so I try to pick on lessons which I hope are broader and then um, where I think things are kind of institution specific I'll, I'll kind of mention that okay so which part of your uh, taking it from our perspective which part of your package is most important to hirers right so you've got your paper which I think we all know is, you know, really the be all and end all ultimately. Um, your references are very, very important. Um, um, I won't talk much about them, but you know, if there's questions we can talk about them. Statements and CV, um, they're important in, in a few specific instances and I'll talk about that later. And then we've got the interview and then the seminar. Okay, so, they're all important, of course, um, but possibly I was going to say that the least important from the, the departmental perspective may be the interview. So, and I'm not sure, not saying that you shouldn't prepare thoroughly exactly as Sun Kung uh, said, but um, when, you know, when all is said and done and at the edge of, end of the process, of course, an interview is important for getting a fly out. But when we're ranking between or kind of deciding between candidates who are going to offer jobs to, you know, I've never heard um, candidates being evaluated on their interview. OK, so obviously the paper is still talked about, the seminar is still talked about, the references may be referred to and the statements and CV will kind of come up, as I mentioned later. You know, interview is really just a segue to getting uh, a fly out. OK, and you know, also we know that people are nervous and um, maybe, uh, you know, some people kind of talk very fluently, some people are quite nervous. So those things are kind of taken into account. So I think the best way of thinking about it is, um, you know, doing a competent job. As Sun Kung just said, you want to prepare your interview so that um, you talk about your existing work clearly and engagingly and get over that hurdle and then try to get to the next hurdle, which is the, you know, the fly out. Um, which is a more, you know, much more engaging process and, you know, you'll be evaluated on ultimately. As I said, I can't remember ranking candidates ultimately and anything said at the interview stage. Okay, so, and then I was going to, you know, ordering those kind of parts of your package. I wanted to say that, the, you know, if you have to do a research or a teaching statement and, and the CV, it's worth bearing in mind those can be important to non-departmental kind of university parties. So this may be particular to Essex, but I think it's kind of relevant to all departments. There's always some kind of out, outside, you know, inputs from the from you know the broader faculty, from social science faculty or whatever of of you know who should be coming to the university. And they may not understand your paper at all. In fact, they won't understand your paper at all. But they, they'll look at things like, you know, if you've been involved in any um, uh, grants or anything, and also your kind of attitude, general attitude to research and, and well, to teaching, and your research statement will be readable. Um, and those kind of things, you know, it's worth bearing in mind, those can be important. So again, I wouldn't spend huge amounts of time on those, um, but remember doing a competent job on, on those aspects can be important at various stages of the hiring process. Okay, thoughts and interviews, which I was gonna talk about, so I've merged it into this talk. And these are things that have been mentioned before by Sian Kern and you probably know before, but it shouldn't be too hard to do a competent job, right? And I think, you know, you just, that half an hour interview or whatever, however long it is, you just wanna kind of do a, a, a competent job, right? To prepare a short oral presentation on each of your papers and doing the, the nesting process, I think is great. And prepare to answer some questions on these. So have your kind of your peers answering, asking you obvi even obvious questions about your papers, uh, I think is very useful. It's worth also bearing in mind or remembering that you know you've spent years focusing in a very detailed way on your papers and you talk to your thesis committee who know your papers very well. From the hiring perspective, you may be, you will be interviewed by people who are not at all in your field and really don't know anything about your work in general and just want an overview, right? So, you know, you want to be able to go into the details but also see the bigger picture and, and sometimes that can be the hard thing. 
And in terms of kind of, you know, ideas for how to push your research forward, it doesn't have to be brilliant, but just know the important questions in your area and, and useful methodologies to pursue and just evidence that you can progress yourself and your agenda. Again, if you can say something for, for a few minutes on that, I think that'd be fine. And then if it comes up in interview, you know, I, I guess this is obvious things, but show you take teaching seriously. I guess talking from the perspective of a kind of research department, but a teaching department, you know, obviously, you know, we want people who are kind of focused first and foremost on research, but then take, take the teaching seriously. That's always something just to, to kind of uh, check off. Okay, some further random thoughts, um, which I hope this is helpful. Um, but, you know, whatever the criterion, and, and Sun Kung kind of mentioned that this is heterogeneous, and it is, what are the criterion that the, that the department is pursuing? So they may have a kind of field agenda, they might want to hire someone in a particular field, or they may have their kind of, to use an American phrase, best athlete um, approach. Um, hiring can be collegial and cooperative on the departmental side, or it can be not so cooperative. So very often to get hired, it's probably like you have at least one person in the department who's beating your drum uh, strongly and really arguing your case. So that's worth bearing in mind. And that could be for various reasons. They may, well, they should really like your work. And I'm sure they will do. Uh, or it may be that they, they think of kind of want to expand a group in the particular area that you're working on. Um, but that can be some, that something to kind of, when you're thinking about from the other side of the market, something that worth bearing in mind and may kind of help you how you kind of navigate um, interviews and, and the whole process. The final thought, which is, you know, which is always a difficult one, because Sinkin kind of started by saying, you know, po po polishing up your paper. And pre, before the application stage, I think that's absolutely critical. So getting your, your abstracts and introductions perfect is at this stage the really most important thing. But when you get a little bit later in the process, so we're getting into kind of December, January, December, January, um, you know, and getting into kind of when departments are, you know, choosing who to make offers to, any output that's near completion, a draft or an R&R &R that can be finished and can be put on your website, you know, will add to your uh, credentials and in departmental discussions you know this is all evidence for one candidate if someone's really kind of you know bigging you up then a, a new paper that's on your website can be talked about and that will, will be evidence in your in your favor so anything that's near completion is probably worth getting on your website um yeah okay so that's all i had to say okay um, thank you ben Right. Uh, you have got a couple of questions have arrived in the chat yes. which you may want to um, respond to. Okay, uh, thank you. And we'll pass on now to Alessandra. Hi, yes, I will share my screen now. Okay, so um, what I would like to talk about briefly now um, is how to make a good presentation of your job market paper. So that's more at the level of the seminar, okay? Um, so before the presentation, it's important that you prepare extremely well. That's uh, something uh, that is really key. You need to like prepare very well. And as uh, uh, some Kuhn said, you have to practice many, many times. And you have to make sure that you know the paper inside out, that's obvious because it's your paper, but also you need to make sure that you have read and are familiar with the literature that you cite. So that's very important. So you don't need to know just the stuff in your paper, which you obviously do, but if you cite some literature, you need to be very familiar with it. You need to have read it and know exactly what it is about. Okay. And then again, practice, practice, practice to reiterate what uh, some whom has said. Okay, then it's a good idea um, at the start of the presentation to have an outline. So this is just an example, it doesn't have to be like this necessarily, but for an empirical paper, you know, you start with an introduction and research background, then have a short literature review, some hypothesis, data, and then your uh, baseline specification and methods, and then your results, and then some conclusions. So have an outline like this, and then throughout the presentation, it's always you good to use the same subtitles 
as in the outline, appropriately numbered. Okay, so people know that this part is about the hypothesis. We know on top of your slide that we have hypotheses, for example. So if somebody um, maybe loses concentration uh, for some time, then when he comes back in, he knows that you're talking about your hypothesis and exactly where you are. So it's always a good idea to use these subtitles uh, throughout uh, the presentation. Okay, then the introduction of your paper, the introduction of your presentation is like maybe the most important thing because people are going to concentrate at the start and then maybe after that they get tired, they lose concentration, they start thinking about uh, other things, but the introduction is key. So in the introduction, you need to very clearly state the question that you're asking. You have to do that in simple words without too much jargon. So just say what you're doing and then explain why this research question is important, okay? And then explain what gap in the literature it fills. So you, show, you talk about uh, a little bit about the key references uh, that relate to your uh, paper, and then you show what exactly you add to this literature. What this literature has not done, that is what you're doing in your paper. What is the gap in the literature that you're filling, okay? And then in the introduction, it's also a good idea to provide a, a brief summary of your uh, data and, and your main results, okay? So the introduction is very, very important. It's really the key part of your presentation. If the introduction is good, then people will be happy and willing to listen uh, what happens next. Otherwise they get bored and lose concentration and then that's it, end of the story. Okay, literature review has to be very short in a, in a job market presentation because uh, like people who are listening to your presentation, they want to know what you have done. They don't want to know what other people have done. So you may have a very good literature review in your paper, but presentations are usually mm, like limited in terms of time. So you cannot really talk too much about what other guys have done. Okay, a little bit is fine, but not too much, okay? Uh, so basically the purpose of the literature, literature review in the job market uh, presentation is to place the paper relative to the literature and then show exactly what is the value added that your paper uh, adds to this literature. What is your contribution? What do you do that other guys have not done? What do you add to the literature that you just talked about? Okay. And then some general points uh, I want to discuss next. Okay, so... Um, um, do not cover too much stuff in a, in a job market presentation because you don't have uh, too much time. So uh, what you want to do is make sure that people get the main point. And then you have several slides and every slide has to have a main purpose, one purpose, one slide, okay? And then one thing that I notice when I attend job market presentations or any seminar presentation, even, even by senior professors, is that they have too much stuff on a single page. So if I'm sitting in the back of the room, I, sometimes I can't see what is in, in the page because it's crammed with stuff. So the main message here is never to put too much information on a single page, okay? So just put main things in the page and then use large font so that people sitting in the back can see what is in your, uh, in your uh, page, okay? And also do not use complete sentences with words like therefore, however, and so on. Use symbols and arrows and stuff so that people can easily get what is the point of this slide. This slide doesn't have too much information in it, just has a few, a few uh, like bullet points. One, uh, every slide has one main purpose and then it's easy to understand what is on this slide, okay? Also, you don't need to provide full list of reference in the job market presentation. And then see what I did in this presentation. I highlight in color the most important parts of each slide. Some people don't like this. I find it helpful again, because if some people are listening to your presentation and they lose concentration for a moment, then they come back to it. And even if they have not listened to what you were saying, they see the red parts and they know that these are the key parts. That's kind of nice. Uh, if you have equations, you need to define all the symbols. However, that may be long and boring. You don't want to do that necessarily on the slide, but you can just uh, define the symbols uh, verbally, okay? And also if you have technical terms, maybe define them verbally, not necessarily on the slide, but make sure that people understand what is on this equation, what is in this uh, slide. Now, if you have empirical papers, you will want to present some results, okay? So many people, what they do, they take the paper, the table from the paper and stick it on the slide. 
that's not good because the table is often, it has a lot of control variables, a lot of stuff which is not really key in what you have to say. So what I would recommend is not to take the original table from the paper and stick it on the slide, but to reproduce on the slide only the most important parts of a table using a sufficiently large font, for example, something like this. You have only a few left-hand side variables, and then the numbers are quite large, and the important numbers that I want to talk about, maybe they're highlighted in blue so that people know that these are the key things that you're going to discuss. So that's a way of doing it, okay? Also, in your presentation, please avoid typos and grammatical inaccuracies. That looks like a very like silly comment, but if I'm attending a job market presentation and the slides of the candidate are full of mistakes, uh, that doesn't look good. He looks he or she looks very lazy. So uh, ask somebody maybe to check your slides. Your supervisor is a good candidate for that. Okay, and then keep track of the time. Uh, so if you know that time is running short, don't start talking very quickly. I used to do that in, when I was on the job market. Talk very quickly, nobody understood what I was going to say. So like talk very slowly and just cut the things that are not that relevant. That relevant. So keep track of time is very important. Okay, and then it's also good to have a conclusion to your uh, presentation in which you summarize your main funding and your contribution, but don't repeat what you have already said. Just stress the bottom line. What is the take home? What is the main message that you want your audience to take home after they leave, okay? And then very important, discuss policy implications of, of your finding or managerial implications, eh, and also discuss implications of your findings for future research. So a great paper is a paper that then other people cite and other people build on to do some even more advanced research later on. So policy implications and implications of um, uh, your findings for future research. Um, and then people will ask questions at the end of your presentation, okay? So people will ask uh, questions. So one important thing is let people finish the question that they're asking, do not interrupt them. Some people are a bit pain because they like to talk a lot, make a question and they start with a very long introduction to the question, which may be a bit boring, but let, let them do it. If that's their question, if their question is long, let them finish the question and do not interrupt them. Okay, and then wherever possible, answer the question precisely. So don't give a background for one hour and then come to the point later. Answer the question precisely, and then maybe add some details. But first, answer the question precisely, then add some detail if you want. It will happen that you don't know the answer to a question. So don't start waffling, just tell the person, if you really don't know, you know what to answer, just tell the guy that it's a good question and that you will really need to think about it in the future, that if you don't know the answer, but don't make up things that are maybe uh, that you make up on the moment because they're not going to be very good. So if you really don't know the answer, just be open on that. Say it is a really good question. I will need to think about it. I will consider it in like my next draft or whatever. Okay. And then um, as, uh, as was said before, the questions that you get uh, um, at, at this type of seminar presentation can be very useful for later. But then you're, you're nervous during a job market presentation, so you may forget the question. So when you finish the presentation, it's good like, to sit down for five minutes and make sure you write down the questions that you received. Uh, and because this may be very useful for later. So don't forget about this question. I mean, there may be some guys who ask very tough questions. You will say this guy is really a pain because he asked such tough questions. But write down those questions anyhow, because maybe these points are really useful and will allow your paper to become uh, better later on. So that is also a very important, um, a very important uh, concept here. Yeah, so this is uh, all I have to say and uh, just wishing you good luck. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Um, now we can move on to Uta uh, and choosing between job offers. Yes, so um, probably this is something that is not yet on your mind that much, but if you get to the point where you get uh, multiple offers, um, first of all, congratulations. Um, I think that's a fantastic place to uh, be at. Um, in terms of how to make a decision, so for me, there were two main ingredients. One was the environment, and the other one was the conditions of the offers. So let me talk about the environment first. So the, the one chance for you to understand what the environment is like 
is the flyout, right? So we've heard a lot now about these, uh, the presentation and all that, and you're probably very nervous and you really see it as a job interview, but it's not just that, it's your one chance to really get to know the place you might be going to. And you should really take that chance, okay? So different aspects you might want to consider are first of all, the department in general. So what's the um, general atmosphere like? Are people quite stressed? Is there a lot of pressure? But also what's the um, research focus of that department? Are there particular fields? Do you fit into that department in terms of your research? Is there any mentoring for young people? What's the en environment like for junior faculty? So these are considerations um, that you might want to, um, want to take in terms of evaluating the department. And those are also questions you can ask during the flyout. Another thing to pay attention to are the people. So that was something that was very important to me to just get a sense of the vibe, get a sense of the people there. Are there people that you know, you'd enjoy talking to about work, but also that you would want to go for lunch with, that you might potentially want to have a beer with? And then the last aspect is the place, right? The town itself, because most likely you will be moving to that new place. So if the flyout is in person, then really take that chance to also take a wander around. Most likely they're gonna show you around anyway, but pay a bit of attention to, is this the place where I can imagine myself uh, living, but also especially if you, for example, have a partner, could your partner find a job there? Uh, would you be overall happy there? Would you have a good work-life balance? So that's sort of, those were sort of the key things for me in terms of the environment. And then come the conditions of the offer. And the conditions of offer can um, vary quite a bit. Um, and the scope to which you can negotiate can also vary quite a bit. So there are some places in, for example, continental Europe, where, where there are very strict regulations in terms of, for example, the salary. So there might not be that much scope for negotiation. There are usually three components that you can negotiate about. One is the salary. The second is the teaching amount. And the third are research funds. And all of these you can potentially negotiate about. And you should think about sort of what out of these three items are important to you. And there is really nothing wrong with, especially if you have multiple offers, you are in a good position to um, negotiate. Um, other than that, what did I wanna talk about? Yes. so. Last point in terms of negotiating, also never lie when you're negotiating, okay? So at the end of the day, there is a lot of private information, but um, if you start making up, uh, I don't know, certain uh, offers you might have that you don't have or conditions that you were offered that you weren't offered, this is always going to come out, okay? So negotiate, but always be honest as well. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the process. So there are these infamous um, exploding offers and they are real. So um, most offers do come with deadlines. That's something, however, that is quite understandable because departments want to hire and departments can't wait forever for you to make up your mind because they want to, um, if you decline, make the offer to someone else, right? So it's quite understandable that departments also have their own um, constraints. And so they put deadlines on your offers. Now, if you are in a situation where you got an offer from a place where that, that you actually are really interested in, but you are waiting for another offer that you might also be interested in, um, 
and there, there are deadlines which basically don't align, then there's really nothing wrong with asking. So I, I did that in my process. Um, I got in touch with the head of department and I just said, look, I am still waiting for another offer. Can you just give me like two more days and then I can get back to you? And they granted me that. So a lot of times they're not doing this to be cruel to you or to put you under pressure or something. So there's really nothing wrong with asking for an extension there. Um, and lastly, uh, also try to be fair, right? So in terms of if you've sort of made up your mind and you already kind of know, I don't really wanna to go to this school, then it's also a bit unfair to just hold on to the offer for the sake of it. So also be fair, especially to the other candidates. And once you know you're not gonna take it, also decline it. Um, yeah, so those were sort of the main points I wanted to talk about. Um, I think the main takeaway or sort of the most important method and how I uh, made my decision in the end was that I did a bit of a visualization exercise where I really thought about, okay, it's the end of summer now, I've done my Viva, I'm a doctor now, and I'm moving to a new place, I'm starting a new job, am I actually excited to go there and to do that? And I ended up choosing the offer where I was most confident to be able to say, yes, I am excited to do this. And for me, that was a very useful tool and maybe that's going to be useful for you as well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Uta. That completes our presentations. As far as I can see in the chat, we've answered all the questions except the last one, uh, which was addressed to you, uh, Uta, about green cards and visas. Uh, I don't know if you want to respond to that verbally even, if it's quicker. Um, so... Unfortunately, I'm not in a situation where I had to no. uh, get a visa. I'm not sure, Ben, if you know more about this. Do any of our panelists know about the visa aspect? So I can aspect? speak to the UK since I was, I'm an American citizen working in the UK Institute. Um, there it was a standardized process. So they wouldn't be interviewing candidates from countries. So. Well, first of all, I, I would put your citizenship on your CVs, right? That's a very clear signal as to whether or not it's feasible to hire you given your nationality. Um, from that point on, they will only interview you if there is a process by which they can actually hire you. Uh, at the point that you're made an offer, you can talk about what the visa process looks like. For coming to the UK, it's quite costly. Um, School to school, there'll be differences on how much flexibility they can have to include in your offer. So relocation costs, visa costs, the NHS costs, things like that. Some places there are rigid rules, some places there may not be, but it's a discussion you can have candidly with an institution once they've made an offer. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Sarah about um, lag periods between interviews and starting dates and uh, flexibility of starting. Um, I don't know who might have a go at that. Ben? Yeah, I mean, typically, I guess you're kind of um, expecting to start in the autumn term, uh, the following autumn. But again, there's flexibility and that's, uh, I mean, increasingly, I, it seems people are kind of doing, having, you know, they're, they're arranging a permanent job or a tenure track job, but also arranging a, a postdoc as well. And so they may go off for a year or they may have like a term visit. So we've had people in the last few years come start and then go off for a, a term or a year, I think, and then come back. Um, so again, these are things you can talk to the, the hiring department about. But I, I, I would suggest doing that at the, you know, when you're at the office stage. So, you know, if you had, um, you wanted a terms leave, then, you know, then I would try to discuss it then. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, I think that really does exhaust all the questions that have arrived in the chat. Uh, anyone want to zap in a, a last one? 
Um, I would like to add one, just one thing um, okay. for the candidates. Uh, that's uh, mostly for people who are going to apply in UK universities. I'm not sure how relevant it is in other institutions, but it may be. So in UK universities, if you end up having an interview there, um, at the end of the interview, uh, the, somebody in the panel will ask you, do you have any questions for us? Now that question never asks how many holidays do I have or how much I have to teach. Don't do that. A good strategy <laughs> is to take a look at you know the university website, the departmental website. Say what, see what are their goals. What is the university strategy, for example, and things like that. And then uh, and then say you know where do you see the department in five years from now. You know something like that. That is kind of a clever question. And if you can relate to the university strategy somehow, so for example, if the university strategy says something, you can refer to that and say how the department relates to this aspect. Then it shows that you did some homework, and that will enhance your chance of getting the job. So you know, don't ask some question about you, but just ask some questions that show that you have done the homework that you have read. The university strategy that you like you want to know how the department relates to that or something of this type that usually is the winner so if you do that you are likely to get the job good luck okay we've got several questions now uh, arriving um i'm just going to read them out and can some panelists please uh, jump in um so the first one from sylvia is can you be more specific about the selection process in particular which part of the CV is most important? Anybody got any thoughts on that? So if you look at uh, across websites of different people, there's kind of a standard CV format that you put at. I mean, in terms of what we on hiring committees will look at on your CV, I mean, if we're a research institute, we're going to go directly to your publications and your working papers and works in process. Um, in particular publications, if you have them at this stage, as a, especially as a graduate student, uh, would be viewed very positively given how difficult it is to publish in economics and the considerable timeline. In terms of what you still have control over, I think it's really the quality of the job market that you submit um, that would be weighed most heavily in terms of what you can do when looking at paper applications. Okay, thank you. Um, will the application process or timeline be similar between the UK and the US job market? Anybody want to comment on that? Um, yeah, I'd say in general, they're quite similar. So the only difference is that um, their European job market, of course, the first interviews, they happen in December, whereas in the US, the first round interviews then happen um, in early January. But after that the timelines are pretty much aligned yeah the only thing i would add there is that um after the u.s market it turnaround is very quick um i know people who i think they had their last first round interview on a tuesday of that week and their first fly out was the friday of the same week so do prepare your seminar presentations prior to the american market because you might get fly outs almost immediately after the american first round concludes Okay, thank you. Um, looking down the list of questions, um, could someone please say a little bit more about how to write a cover letter? What should be included? Anybody have a well, go I, at that? I think I can say a couple of things. I think the cover letter, you can't have the same cover letter for every institution where you apply. So if you have time, make the cover letter specific to the institution. And then um, just summarize what are your main, um, what are your main uh, abilities, uh, your main field and things like that. And then, um, yes, I think it would be uh, useful also to, to show why uh, you, you feel you would be a good fit in this particular department where you are applying. So again, if you look at the website of the department, you find what people are there. And if you can like show that your work relates to Mr. X's work and Dr. X's work and that you could collaborate with them, and that would be beneficial. So uh, if people see a cover letter which 
clearly demonstrate that you have spent some time looking at that department and then the cover letter is tailored for that department, giving specific examples uh, about people working in that, in that department and how your work can relate to them, that gives a good signal that you're really interested in that department. And it's not just one of the 200 where you apply. So if, especially for those places that you like most, that you're more, most keen to get, do a proper cover letter and do a longish cover letter to show that gives a clear signal. Thank you. The only thing I would add there is um, you can't do that for a hundred institutions, right? You don't have time that you <laughs> need it, you know, <laughs> there's a finite amount of time in the day. So you do want to be judicious about which places you put in that extra effort. And some places are more likely to notice that extra effort versus not. Uh, LSE is not going to notice that extra effort. They know that you want to go there. If they're going to give you a job offer, they know that they're, you know, a top institution, but way down in the rankings if there's somewhere that you have a really strong locational preference or maybe they're very teaching focused and you love teaching those are the kinds of places where the, the extra effort may be worth it right. and one or other of you too can a cover letter be longer than one page i would generally advise against it <laughs> <laughs> i think more time is will be spent reading your abstracts and introductions than cover letters typically uh, Hugo is asking, what if you've only got a paper for the job market, which has already been published? Does that uh, hold against you? Um, and, I'll come in with an opinion. I, I don't you know. It's, it's very difficult to tell what papers you should be using, but this is what it seems. There seems to be a kind of taboo against using uh, published papers, and I, I don't think that's a problem. Um, if you have a paper that's just come out in Econometrica and, you know, that's far better than your current kind of what you're working on, that, you know, you present that clearly. Um, so I don't think so. And I, I can remember instances of people who were stars on the market with, with actually with, a, I remember a case clearly with somebody who had a paper published in the American Economic Review and they did very well on the market and didn't help, didn't hold them back, of course. Okay, we've got a question. Sorry. Go on, Sanka. I was just going to say, uh, I mean, the, the, where it gets published imposes a very precise signal as to the quality of the paper relative to other papers. So if you get it published in a good place, that's only a good thing. It's only a good signal. Yeah. Um, question, when would you think it best to communicate about having a partner who is also on the market? Uh, anybody got a thought on that? That's something that you can put clearly in a cover letter and it should be in the reference letters as well um, from your, so make be very clear with your, whoever's writing a, or your lead reference letter, your sort of advisor, that'll be one of the kind of first things they mention. it's, yeah. Okay, um, question about um, the difference between applying for postdoc positions versus tenure track positions. Um, what's the difference? Who'd like to comment on that? So I think it depends on the postdoc. There are some postdocs that are very much you're being brought in to do research. Um, there's there's the only difference is a finite time clock as opposed to an indefinite uh, time timeline. There are some postdocs where you're bring, being brought in more to work with a specific team or specific person. So they're matching what you do and what they do is particularly important more so than say a tenure track position. But you know, these sort of postdocs like the one at NYU Abu Dhabi where you get three years with no teaching responsibilities, to just try to do research. They're just gonna evaluate you on the quality of the research kind of like any other place really yeah okay we're getting towards the end of the session so i'm going to be selective on these questions i don't think we've got time for all of them how can someone best signal in the european job market that they're willing to move to europe after completing their phd in the us anybody like to comment on that so I think one good way is to communicate that, first of all, clearly to your department, so your placement officer, as well as your uh, letter writers, 
because they can already sort of then um, extend this information to European departments that you're interested in. And I wrote these types of locational preferences into my cover letter as well at the bottom, um, stating that I have, for example, certain uh, locational preferences. And uh, sort of in a way linked to that, uh, if one's really keen to go to a particular place, and applies both for a postdoc that they're offering and an assistant professor position, does that weaken the strength of the application to be an assistant professor? Any thoughts on that? I can see why you might think that. I would, if the selection committee is doing a thorough job, generally I would say no. It doesn't weaken you because they'll still evaluate you on the merits of the work that you're submitting right so if you were applying to nottingham and you applied to both a postdoc and the ap position we would probably decide amongst ourselves which one to offer you if we wanted to make you an offer knowing that you've submitted to both as opposed to immediately say disregarding the ap one for example right um so i would i wouldn't be too worried about that personally i don't know if others have dis different opinions Okay, and the last question, because our session is coming to an end, how does a multiple authored paper look compared with a single authored paper? Is it better to go to the market with a single authored paper, um, other things equal? Uh, any thoughts on that? Ben, you were commenting on um, having already published it, perhaps you could follow up with this one. Yeah, I mean, in general, I'd say all these questions about which paper to go to the market with, I mean, these are, you know, questions to have, um, so these are issues to talk with your advisors about. I mean, it's very difficult for us to kind of assess. I mean, yeah, I think the, the market does kind of prefer a single author paper just because it's very clear um, who's, done the, who's done which bits of the paper. But again, I mean, um, multiple author paper is not is not a kind of death knell i wouldn't say um so again it's really um something to talk to your advisor about if they if they think the the the, the multiple author paper is substantially better and puts you in a better light then maybe there's an argument to go to the market with that okay thank thing... oh, sorry. sorry just a quick addendum another thing that i think makes a difference is whether the other authors are your PhD advisors or whether there are other, you know, for example, younger PhD students. Um, usually it is not, I, I think the penalty isn't that high if it's another PhD student, but there might be a penalty if it is your PhD advisor. Okay, I think it's time now for me to uh, wrap up the session. Uh, so let me thank Alessandra, Ben, Uta and Sun Kun for excellent contributions during uh, the afternoon. Uh, thank Georgina in particular for her work in uh, organising this, uh, but also, of course, the Education and Training Committee who sort of sat me, uh, behind it. Uh, we see in the chat from Georgina that the uh, recording will be uh, posted tomorrow, so you can look at that. And there is a, a survey which I think is on the screen now, which uh, we'd like you, if you would, to uh, answer the questions and submit it. So thank you very much and goodbye.